In this week's Parsha, Parshat Ki Tetze, we read about 74 of the Torah's 613 mitzvot. We learn about numerous commandments, just a handful of which include returning a lost object, sending away the mother bird before taking her young, and the various forms of kilayim, of forbidden plant and animal hybrids. Also featured in the Parsha is a delineation of those who cannot marry a person of Jewish lineage, a list which of course includes a mamzer, someone born from, a, from an adulterous or incestuous relationship. The Parsha continues in this legal fashion, discussing the prohibition against turning in an escaped slave, the duty to pay a worker on time, the proper treatment of a debtor, and many other prohibitions. Finally, the Parsha concludes with an obligation related to our ancient mortal enemies, Amalek. Dvarim, Perk Chafhe, Pasuk Yud Tet. Dvarim, chapter 25, verse 19, the very last Pasuk in this week's Parsha, reads as follows. Vehaya, Behiniach Hashem Alokecha Lecha, Mikoi Vecha, Misaviv, Ba'aretz Asher Hashem Alokecha Notein Lecha, Nachala Lerishta, it will be. When the Lord your God grants you respite from all your enemies around you in the land which the Lord your God gives to you as an inheritance to possess, that you shall obliterate the remembrance of Amalek from beneath the heavens. You shall not forget. This pasuk, and in particular its commandment regarding Amalek, is rife with contradictory language. Obliterate the remembrance. Well, how do you obliterate a remembrance? And if you have a remembrance to obliterate, have you already violated this commandment? And even if we concede that maybe we can obliterate a remembrance, well, two words later, the Pasuk concludes, Lo tishkach, you shall not forget. A solution to this direct contradiction can be found less than four Pasukim beforehand where the Parsha transitions from discussing the laws governing just business practice to the commandment to obliterate or remember or whatever it is with Amalek. Verse 15 of the same chapter reads, Even shleima vatzedek yelach. Eifa shleima vatzedek yelach. Leman ya'arichu yamecha al ha'adama asher Hashem elokecha notein lach. You shall have a full and honest weight and a full and honest eifa measure in order that your days will be prolonged on the land which the Lord your God gives you. The next pasuk, verse 16, Ki tovavat Hashem alokecha kol osei ele kol osei avel. For whoever does these things, whoever perpetrates such injustice, is an abomination to the Lord your God. And the next verse, verse 17, Zachor et asher asalecha amalek baderech b'seitzchem mimitzrayim. You shall remember what Amalek did to you on the way when you went out of Egypt. So keep in mind, in verse 19 we were commanded to obliterate our remembrance of Amalek and to not forget, which is sort of synonymous with remember. But here, in verse 17, immediately following the prohibition of deceiving an unsuspecting business partner, the commandment is only, Zachor et asher asalecha Amalek. Remember what Amalek did to you. Rashi notes the juxtaposition of these two passages, the commandments to conduct their business and to remember Amalek, and suggests a possible explanation. He proposes that these two passages were placed next to each other to teach us that if we use fraudulent measures and weights, we should be worried about provocation from the enemy. In other words, we would then be at risk of attack by our enemies, as Israel was attacked in the desert by Amalek. I would like to take Rashi's premise but go in another direction. I, too, believe that there is certainly a reason for the juxtaposition of these two passages, just as I believe that there is a reason for the discrepancy between the two verses that discuss our obligation regarding Amalek. Rather than warning us that fraudulent business practices put us at risk of attack by our enemy, I believe that the prohibition of deceiving your business partner is juxtaposed with the specific and sole obligation to remember what Amalek did in order to teach us that if we defraud our business partner, we are just like Amalek. How so? As some of you may recall, Amalek 
did not just attack B'nai Israel, but they attacked B'nai Israel when B'nai Israel were most vulnerable, as they were traveling through the desert, very tired and weary. And Amalek did not only attack B'nai Israel when they were most vulnerable, but Amalek attacked the most defenseless members of B'nai Israel, the women and children who were traveling at the rear. So the Torah is telling us to remember this behavior of Amalek. Behavior which qualifies as near the lowest of the low. Choosing to hurt someone when he or she is most vulnerable and least suspecting. By juxtaposing this behavior, which is so evident in Amalek's actions, with deceitful business practice, the Torah is underscoring that the same core evils are present in both acts of injustice. Your business partner, who is operating in good faith, trusting your measurements and willing to do business with you, which also benefits you, is in an extremely vulnerable position. Swindling him out of his money is on the same level of wickedness as Amalek's attack on the Jews in the desert. By employing this understanding and our effort to reconcile the discrepancy between the two verses with commandments regarding Amalek, we can learn something about Judaism. First, let us acknowledge with the commandment in verse 17, what Zechor to share a Salacha Amalek, remember what Amalek did to you, really means. This obligation to remember has in fact no connection to Amalek. It does not want us to remember Amalek. It wants us rather to remember the evils that Amalek committed. This remembrance, therefore, is one of only the action and not of the perpetrator. Thus, the really is no discrepancy at all. When verse 19 states, Timche et Zecher Amalek, obliterate the remembrance of Amalek, it is commanding us to destroy the memory of Amalek, to wipe out any evidence of such a wicked people. And when verse 19 concludes, Lo tishkach, you shall not forget, it is commanding us, just as it did in verse 17, to not remember Amalek, but to remember the actions that Amalek committed. This distinction is very significant, and I think it epitomizes Judaism's optimism. We should never look to hurt someone else. We should only look to better ourselves. Out of a horrible event, like Amalek's ambush of our ancestors, we are not taught to seek revenge. Rather, we come away with the practical lesson that we should only conduct fair and honest business. This is the same sort of optimism that allows us to not lose faith in the world after an event like the Holocaust, but to say never forget, and to learn that we should always look out for each other, always be our brother's keepers. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom.